Hi, and welcome to lesson three in our nucleus unit. We're now going to start to look at the nucleus in depth and understand that not all nuclei are created equal, uh, particularly in terms of their stability. So let's go in and take a look. If you think about the nucleus, it's kind of a weird situation because there's protons in there and there's neutrons in there. And the neutrons don't have any charge, but the protons have a positive charge. And if you remember back from what you learned when you learned about electrical charges, probably one of the first things that you learned was that like charges repel. And so why isn't that happening in the nucleus? Why aren't the protons all repelling from each other to the point where the nucleus just disintegrates? What is it that holds the nucleus together? Well, it turns out that there's a fundamental force of nature called the strong nuclear force. And this is strong because it's incredibly strong. It holds these positively charged protons together uh, along with their neutrons, but it only acts at very, very, very small distances, like the kind of distances that we're talking about when we're talking about nuclei. So that's really what's keeping the nucleus together. And so this graph is just showing you the amount of energy that's put into holding each nucleon together in a bunch of different atoms of various different masses. And you can see that it increases as the mass of the nucleus increases up to a certain point and then it starts to decrease. And this helps to explain why once we get too big, everything is just unstable. There's just not enough energy in order to hold all of those nucleons together. And so once we get above uh, element number 83, right, once we get above bismuth, everything that we see after that is unstable or what we call radioactive. So that established, we can start to understand what contributes to the stability of a particular nucleus. When the strong nuclear force has enough energy to keep the nucleus intact, that nucleus is going to be stable. And when it doesn't, the nucleus is going to disintegrate. That's what we call a radioactive nucleus. So you've heard this term before, radioactive. Really what this means is that the nucleus is going to emit particles, nuclear radiation. And because it is unstable, the nucleus is going to start to break down. And so this is one particular example of nuclear radioactivity. We see uranium-238, and it emits a particle called an alpha particle. And that produces an atom of thorium-234, right? That particle is given off. And thorium is still not stable, but at least it's closer to stability, if you want to think about it that way. So it's important to understand that when we determine the stability of an atom, it really has to do with the number of nucleons it has and the ratio of neutrons to protons in those nucleons. So elements 1 to 83 on the periodic table have at least one stable isotope. Uh, but no atom with an atomic number of 84 or up has a stable isotope. At that point, the number of nucleons is just too massive for the strong nuclear force to hold everything together. And if you look down below, you get a lot of unstable isotopes that are below 83 protons in the nucleus. We start to see unstable isotopes at the first element in hydrogen. Hydrogen-3, for instance, is an example of a radioactive isotope of hydrogen. That's because that ratio of neutrons to protons, 2 to 1, is just not going to lead to a stable nucleus able to be held together by the strong nuclear force. So when nuclei are unstable, they're going to emit particles, and we're going to call those particles nuclear radiation. Radiation is just a term for energy, and there's a lot of different forms of energy, as we've already learned. Uh, in our next unit, we'll talk about electromagnetic radiation, which is a totally different kind of radiation than this radiation. But this is nuclear radiation. It's radiation that comes from the nucleus. In the example of this uranium atom, it's giving off an alpha particle, which is one form of nuclear radiation. There's actually six major types of nuclear radiation, and these are given to you on reference table O. This is actually not reference table O. This is a more graphical representation of reference table O, but this shows the six major types of nuclear radiation. This is the way it looks on reference table O, and you can see the same six types of nuclear radiation. And all of these are emissions that come from the nucleus of the atom. It will produce these emissions as the nucleus breaks down. It's important to understand that the way that a particular radioisotope decays is specific to that particular isotope. And so this is shown on reference table N. So here are the five major types of nuclear decay modes that you need to be familiar with. And if we look at reference table N, and I'll go and I'll make this bigger so you can see what's going on, you can see that each of the isotopes on reference table N has a specific decay mode. So for instance, gold-198 produces beta particles. Uranium-238 produces 
alpha particles. Uranium-238 is not going to produce beta particles. Gold-198 is not going to produce alpha particles. Each isotope has a specific mode of decay, and the ones that you need to be most familiar with are the ones that are given to you on reference table N. If you ever forget what one of these decay modes is, you can always go to reference table O and find the symbol on reference table O, and that will tell you what the decay mode is. When we consider different forms of nuclear radiation, there are ways to describe them. One of the major ways that we like to think about it is by thinking about the electrical charge of that nuclear radiation. So nuclear radiation can be positively charged, it can be negatively charged, or it can be neutrally charged. What this graphic is showing you is the passing of a source of different kinds of radiation through a series of electrically charged plates. And you can see that the beta rays are attracted towards the positively charged plate. And the alpha rays are attracted towards the negatively charged plate. That's because the beta rays are negatively charged and the alpha rays are positively charged. Gamma rays are not attracted to either and that's because they are neutrally charged. So it is possible to separate out the different components that are being emitted from nuclei by subjecting them to an electrical field. Of course, you and I are not going to do that on a regular basis because nuclear radiation is incredibly dangerous for biological systems to be around in larger doses than our natural background sources. Another way to think about how you can separate out different types of radiation is by their penetrating power or what the different particles can travel through. This is showing the penetrating power of four different types of radiation. What's interesting about penetrating power is that there is essentially an inverse relationship between the mass of the particle and how far in it can penetrate. So considering alpha particles, which are the most massive particles that a nuclei can produce, they can be stopped actually by a sheet of paper. They'll be absorbed by that paper. Beta particles are considerably less massive and they can travel through paper, through human hands, before they're stopped by sheets of metal. Neutrons are actually more massive than beta particles, but they can travel a little bit further, and that is actually a function of their charge. The fact that they have no charge makes it much easier for them to travel through other atoms. And actually gamma rays, which are actually a form of high energy light, can travel through the most types of material and actually have to st be stopped by large pieces of concrete or lead. It's important to understand that when an unstable radioactive nuclei produces nuclear radiation, the identity of that atom will change. This is called a transmutation. So to go back to our example of uranium-238, it produces an alpha particle, and in so doing, its identity changes to thorium-234. That's because it's given off two protons, and since its atomic number has now shifted, its identity has changed. This is the only time in chemistry that we'll ever see this kind of thing happening. If you actually go back to the early history of chemistry, it came out of the tradition of what was called alchemy, which was sort of a proto-chemistry where people were trying to discover ways to get elements to do things that they can't really do. And one of the major quests in alchemy was to turn lead into gold but they never had any success. It actually turns out that you can turn lead into gold through nuclear chemistry. Unfortunately, you can't do it for a large number of lead atoms uh, to the point where you'd even be able to observe them. So it's not really a functional way to produce gold. It's much easier to go and dig it out of the earth. But at the same time, this kind of approach, what the alchemists wanted to do of turning one element into another for a long time was rejected until developments in nuclear chemistry demonstrated that in fact, some atoms do turn into other atoms through the process of nuclear decay. Finally, you should understand that as an atom goes through nuclear decay, it can travel through many different identities as it emits a whole series of decay particles. This is called a decay series. What we've shown here is the uranium-238 decay series. Starting as uranium-238, that atom is going to travel through a large number of decays until it finally winds up as non-radioactive, stable lead-206. Different isotopes have different decay series that they can travel through, with each one being characteristic of the particular decay of a particular isotope. But at the end of every decay series is finally a stable isotope that that element remains at. Thanks so much for watching our introduction to nuclear stability. Make sure that you can do the following here at the end. Make sure that you can explain the difference between stable and radioactive nuclei, particularly in terms of the ratio of protons to neutrons, the total number of nucleons, and the strong nuclear force. Make sure that you can recognize the different types of nuclear radiation that radioactive nuclei produce as they decay. Make sure that you can compare the charges and penetrating power of different types of nuclear radiation. 
And finally, make sure that you can explain what occurs during a decay series, why an isotope moves through a series of different isotopes before finally reaching a stable isotope. If you can do all of those things, you're doing great. If not, take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always get in touch with me through the information in the info field or by leaving a comment on the video. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.